All right, so this is Coach Nefarious, and I'll be analyzing your game on Zyra with an Ash against Draven and Teemo. So let's get right into it. Now, first of all, we're just going to do some play-by-play, -play, and we're going to go over the lane in some amount of detail. So let's just get right into it. All right, so you start out here. Stepping in the brush, getting that brush control. They don't know where you are. Draven walking about randomly. Now, in this case, in this lane, you do have the slope which going. So, you essentially want to remain in this little part over here. Um, you could even exit the brush and walk up even further if Ash did as well. If Ash starts moving up like this, then you can move along with her. But right now, you don't have to draw back to, like, way past this line, you know what I mean? Like, you can even even past this line. Like, you can stay at the very edge of the brush and just apply the most pressure you can in any given situation, which is going to be relevant soon, right? Because obviously that itself, right now, you can still make big motions in lane and be fine. Um, but it's about it's about discipline, which is going to show up very soon. What that can do in the lane. So here we see Timo exiting the brush, and we see the first thing that Ash does is land a CS and walk backwards, which is crazy, right? Look at where Draven is. Draven is way over here. He's completely out of the fight, right? He he would have to walk up um, a million miles like this in order to participate in the fight. So it's two v one. Look at this, it's an isolated trade onto a Teemo. Completely 2v1. And both of you guys have the intuition to turn around. Right, it's like an incoming threat, so let's walk away. As soon as he walks up here, out of this brush, um, you should be checking what Ash is going to do. Because if Ash does absolutely nothing, you only treat, trade evenly. But here, your first response should be to stand and fight, right? And if your Ash is being absolutely idiotic, that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be the end of the world, but it wouldn't be great either. So here, this is one situation in which, see this, in which Ash actually does turn around, but you haven't really taken the opportunity to auto attack or trade at all. Um, and that was a very, very important moment for me, which... Which is so important, not because of the outcome in the lane, but because of the way that this is set up. The way that this is just like a 2v1, right? And you guys are both on one person. Um, but the 2v1 doesn't really happen, right? And if you in, in this moment, if you were to stand and fight instead of turn around, you wouldn't... Essentially, your team, your, your lane in general, wouldn't lose any more or less HP than if you... Um, walk back. You can't let Teemo just walk up here and take control over the entire lane either, right? That would be very silly if that were possible. So this doesn't work on very many levels. Um, so you need to keep that in mind. That is a very important lane fundamental is the isolated trades in bot lane. The constant wiggling about and trying to catch people stepping up a little too far. In this case, he stepped up very heavily. Okay, you do have a slow push going, so you can just keep walking up here. And here you get the same idea. Ash wants to be like more towards the brush. He wants she wants to be able to immediately land an auto attack. She should be in the range of this little uh, side of the brush here, this little exit point of the brush. That's where she wants to be, so that you guys can both two of you want the Teemo. There's no AOE, so you guys can stand on top of one another just fine. That's not a problem. She wants to be a little bit closer to that bottom of the lane. She doesn't want to go all the way up to the brush. That's craziness. That has no purpose at all. Just stay t close to the exit point. And you guys, you guys have lane control, so you should be pushing. What you can do is essentially, let's say, um, just for the sake of our argument, right? I'm just gonna draw a little box. Um, let's say that you are over here and Ash is over here, and you want both the both of you to stand over here but if you reach like too far out from ash you're gonna get hit so let's say this is the center line so let's say you make this little move to an area where it gets dangerous and you watch what ash does you stand here for a second and wiggle and look if ash moves along with you 
or if she just completely ignorantly walks back. And then you decide whether you keep going or whether you back off. So you can test the waters a little bit because you are playing in low elo solo queue to see what your teammate's gonna do. And since you should be asserting lane control here, you can walk up just outside of Draven's auto range and see if Ash walks up with you. And if she doesn't, you'll have to, you know, draw back a little bit. Here you can you can essentially use your abilities on Draven's animation locks because you know they just give you that tiny little window. Right now he was just walking back and forth, he didn't have to CS either. This lane it's it isn't a clean Um okay, okay, just a second, just a second. Alright. So Timo's still in that brush. Just hiding out there. Ash doesn't respond for a second. Now they both do. So Timo doesn't have enough damage on his own, and obviously that's just Infidorino. Like he doesn't he can't kill you, therefore it's a silly, silly, silly fight. He still had ignite as well. Um You can try and walk up to him and ignite him and then walk out, but I don't that's not really like a big deal. This is like if you're if you're playing on the safe side, that's absolutely fine. Like you can you can function with playing on the safe side, and it's just it's just fine. And uh, in this case, you can just damage the minions because obviously you just do you do want to just complete the slow push. Um, I wouldn't be trying to poke out Draven even more in this situation. Ash is kind of seems to be indicating that she wants to back. So in that case. Um, you just go back with her. This is obviously not a problem. Both on the same page here. What did she get? Two long swords. Very fair. No potions. Okay. No potions. No nothing. No nothing. All right. All right. Interesting choice. The laning at this stage, you don't. I don't know if that was placed by you or by the by who that was placed. But since you can gain control over the rush at any stage, you don't need that ward. You're already standing on top of the location you're warding and you don't intend to lose control over it in the future either. So you would only do that, let's say, if you're being massively pushed and this is one second before you're going to be under turret and you're afraid of the lane gank. So you might as well ward now so that you, you don't have to try and force yourself into that spot later. But that's not the situation here at all, right? So that is essentially a wasted ward, which is which is a very big resource, right? Um, you can use that to scout out the, the, the graves if you have a slow push on your hand soon. And this Teemo, I don't know what he's doing, but good job, you guys. I mean, come on. That's good. So far, the results are good. Alright, well that's fair enough. Make sure that you place it on the that you use the indicator, that you place it in such a way that it hits this ledge, and then you can pl place it in such a way that it reaches as far as you can into the lane. Um, I think there's a moment where it's gonna leave this ledge, so you wanna make sure you hit both of those ledges. Um, and in that case, if you place it on the outside, you can place it furthest away from this point, right? Like, just by... As soon as you hit the brush, that's where you place the ward. So it's a little bit of... That, that is just a very, very tiny point. Just a very, very tiny little thing about positioning of the ward. So at this stage, you're doing very well. Um, it's very very sensible not to push this and instead just let this sit in center. So this very sensible wave management Don't need to auto that that's on the ash of course don't need to auto that minion Need to hit that CS lost the CS Hits minions that she doesn't need to doesn't walk up so there's a lot of stuff happening on ashes side here uh, Which is good to be aware of but obviously outside of your immediate control this is a moment where 
you land a root, but you didn't have that guarantee. Essentially, if you... Whoops, I don't know where I cut off, but I'm gonna keep going with play-by-play, -play, so this is part two. Anyway, this was just another example that we're getting into right here. Right here is one more moment where Timo exits that brush, and you really, really have to be cooking this inside your mind, like, um, like letting it simmer, like, if, if there's this, any guy walking up 2v1 in a lane like this, especially with half health like this, he should be immediately dead. It should never happen, right? These these people should never be allowed to do that. And this is a good example of where he again walks up so far. Um, and he keeps walking as well, like it's crazy. You don't have to issue backwards commands, you can just kite around the Draven towards the Teemo. So you make a step towards the bottom of the lane here. So here, you want to move into him like this. You want to move into him, directly into him I would even say. And just keep auto attacking and taking damage. Like you do get the kill here anyway, but you should be going in on that 100%. Like 100%. Let's say Draven heals him and he might get away with this one because of that. You want to be right on top of him, right? And this is an easy win. Ash has heal, by the way. Right? What? Wait, she didn't have heal? Okay, my bad, my bad. Alright, sorry. My bad, my bad. There's, this is very interesting. Because you're standing still, which is usually not a good thing. I mean, in this case, the results aren't too bad, right? Because Draven is flashing in. But you want to be moving into a direction... Um, where you want to be, right? Like, let's say, if you think you can kill this guy, you want to move towards him so that he would have to gain more distance in some direction to get away from you. If you want... Yeah, if you if, if you want to be at any place in the lane, let's say you're afraid of the graves, you can walk backwards, and, for example, if you want to hit a linear skill shot, you can line yourself up with his escape path towards his turret, right? Let's say he wants to move like this, you can try and get yourself over here. So there's very many opportunities to space around and get somewhere where you currently aren't. Um, just make sure that... That's like a discipline thing. Again, like, I, I differentiate in mistakes like of different magnitudes, right? So, for example, if you're spacing very far back in the lane, let's say you position yourself all the way to the center of that brush, but you couldn't have traded at that moment anyway. That's when I call it a matter of discipline, Instead of, oh, you lost something because of it, right? It's just like, it's going to reflect in things that do actually impact the game at some point, but perhaps not at that point. So that's, that's just a way I analyze um, mistakes based on context. All right, and since this is slow pushing, it makes perfect sense to shove it, except for the fact that here... Um, I mean, here, honestly, you don't have any viable tools. Lee Sin should be here to shove the wave with you. And you should be calling for him to shove the wave with you. And if he doesn't do that, then you have no option but to concede the wave, because Graves could effectively come in here and kill you. But th that's, that's a really big problem, because this wave is awkwardly frozen outside of their turret now. Uh, that's, that's horrible. Like, it's absolutely horrible. Like, it's, it's not that terrible because they can't sustain the freeze, so once you get there, you can just break it, right? Because they're so far behind, there's no way they're going to have, uh, like, control over that wave. But it's still a lost experience, right? So it's it's not the end of the world, but it's also not good. It should have definitely been uh, hard shoved by Lee Sin, who then also gets extra experience onto himself. It's just a win-win situation. You deny the enemy experience, you get more experience on your jungler on the support, and on the AD carry. Literally everyone gets a, gets a benefit out of this. Alright. So there's some canoodling going on in the river. Graves walking up, Timo walking up. I can't see what's going on, but that's not too big of a deal. Um, there's a... This was a little bit of hesitation where... You don't know if you need to be there and help out, or if you if you need to help out the Ash. If you can see here, in this in this case, like Ash is being engaged on, you might as well help out there. He's standing still here, so like you need to make a decision in in like one second, right? Like, like leading up to this situation, you should already have some indication of what you're going to do. 
uh, and where you're going to go because right now you're kind of in the middle of two things not not making up your mind to go to either one of these two situations and in this case the ash barely lives um, but again right that's an outcome but the the way you get there is, is is not ideal in this case right you would rather make up your mind as soon as you can without any hesitation of I'm going to move here and I'm going to do this and here the, the, the I, I notice a, a general pattern right just a general um, what do I call it a sort of I wouldn't call it attitude not attitude in terms of behavior but attitude in terms of how you play the game which is a little bit careful and I would say a little bit too careful um, not like not just like actually assessing risks and playing around that but I mean being sort of afraid in moments where you don't need to be afraid let's say you're level six this Timo if he gets hit by a root would get one shot immediately um, and you're just very very down in, in this lane right now and Graves can't do a whole lot about that Draven is dead and Lee Sin seems to be doing Jack all I don't really know like I haven't seen him around he's not here for the dives or for the infernal or whatever he's not doing much but that's not really the point um, you're still in control of this lane on your own merits so in this case you can just auto attack the plates all the time without any hesitation just auto attack auto attack auto attack auto attack just do that all the time you know what I mean like and they walk backwards a little bit walk backwards and then you auto attack stand still that's the discipline again coming in like there is no situation in, in which you should stop moving around with your mouse um, it's it's a habit right it's not like I can say like if you don't do this then you're not gonna climb like that would be bogus right that's not my point my point is it's a matter of discipline to always be wiggling always be moving always be quick in your decision making uh, whether it's very impactful or not it's going to show up in certain situations and here the graves is coming in the the problem is like you get you guys get the plate kind of late you, what, what the plan would be in this situation right is shove the wave get a plate and go back for example um, but the problem is that here it takes a little bit longer than needed because of this little step backwards here by the both of you to get this plate but then if you shove the wave then Draven is gonna get back here right but you also don't shove the wave immediately after getting the plate so it's like it's hard to coordinate this when you have a random AD carry but as soon as she commits to shoving a wave you can just try and shove it with her as soon as you can and Dra Gra Graves walks in way too soon needs to flash out that is absolute bogus but this would turn out very poorly if, if this was set up better by the enemy team especially if, if one of them baits uh, baits out your engage in your ultimate and can survive with the graves blind for example whoa whoa oh oh, oh. all right yeah that's just fine I don't think that great that that Draven wants none of that yeah there you go let's keep going he turns around so it, like he he shouldn't be engaging he shouldn't he should be fine but then you spot that he turns around and you just abuse it that's perfect that's perfect no comment that's just uh, exactly you know that is what I call uh, playing with what 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 is the term again it's, it's a Dutch term that's like a certain resolve yeah I, I guess they call it resolve right that you're resolved in your decisions you know what to do like you know in your head before it happens if this guy turns around he's dead that's resolve right if you're like if these guys show up at least in I'm bolting there or screw that guy I'm gonna help out ash right something like like that like you you kind of it I wouldn't call it a level of planning and awareness where you're actually actively planning out everything that's going to happen it's just more of a um, I have confidence in my decisions and I'm going to make decisions quickly and aptly and then planning is more of a um, you know if you expand on that and really go through all the different options all the different things that you can do and this this Timo 
This Teemo is absolutely getting clobber stomped. I mean, you guys, you guys, like, you guys are playing so... Whoops, I cut off again because I'm an idiot and Vandicam only records 10 minutes in the free version. All right, let's keep going. So here, Teemo's in that brush. First point I want to make is, well, if he can be in a linear space, you want to throw your linear skill shots um, being lined up with that brush, with that space, right? So let's say if he... It's literally just like... If you had a skill shot like this, then you would throw it like that, right? And if you have a skill shot that goes in this direction, then you're going to stand over here and throw it, right? Or whatever. You know what I mean, right? You want to make sure that you get as much of the space as possible and that you don't throw a skill shot like this, for example, right? So that is just a tiny little point, a tiny little remark. So you guys can both space accordingly. You do hit the root, however. In this case, you guys can both walk in, right? Draven is nothing right now. Draven is 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 just a piece of candy with 300 gold written on it. Like you guys can just farm him out if he keeps battling you guys. Like you have vault as well. So honestly, this should be instant engage by the both of you, right? Just keep going, keep going, keep going. You are in control. Right, it's 2v1, Draven was level down, uh, two levels down even actually, sorry, Draven was two levels down on the both of you, right, so there should be no way in which you're debating how hard you can go in, you should be, just be go, 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 right, 100% commitment, you would lose to, let's say, a four man, right, if, if, if Lux and Graves come in there, then it might be hard, but that was not the situation that we need to worry about. Graves comes in there, and is like, what do I do? I guess I do nothing. Oh, 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 good cue, bro. All right. So, you guys have plenty of kills. This is the situation in which I see a lot of mid lane play. So here you want to make sure your team gets Baron. Here Baron is spawned. So in this in these events leading up to Baron, you want to make sure that you... Uh, you mentioned this in your analysis as well, right? So you were talking about um, playing around your win conditions and that kind of stuff. And this is a good example to talk about that. This is where you got the tier 2 top lane, you got the tier 2 mid lane, right? So you got the entire setup. You got an open inhibitor over here. But inhibitors are hard to reach. So if you want to get an inhibitor, you need like all five to be on the same page. Uh, and if, if you see that's the case, you can do it. Otherwise, the much easier objective is Baron, right? Because Baron, Baron in, in a neutral situation, Baron would be very difficult to take. But the inhibitor is very deep into enemy territory, right? So it has no defense if you just walk here as a five man and they can't stop your five man then the inhibitor is very easy but if you need to make rotations happen like this like if you need to split push right then you have to realize that they have very tiny space in which they can rotate and they have a very tiny space in which they can base and come back with home guards those are two very important things right so the baron is obviously in the center of the map right it's like all the way down at the center and you can zone them off of this entire area, right? Like, this should be completely uh, dominated by you. So you can you can just get into this jungle and put a ward over here, right? Uh, it's, it's hard for me to place it with the tablet perfectly. You can start, like, pink warding in the pixel brush. Put a pink ward over here. Let's say you put a lane ward in the center. You pink ward... This little cheeky little brush, just an unnoticed pink ward. Let's say you have like a deep pink ward on the other side to just make sure you track their movements, but that's like not really relevant unless there's like an elder or something going on like that. Just make sure you get the Baron Vision, that's the most important thing. And the execution I just talked about just now is again, th th those are peripherals, right? You can figure it out if you just ask yourself, where should my wards be? Well, honestly, there's one little junction where it would spot four different routes so that's probably where you want a ward to be right 
So there's all these little trade-offs you can make there, but those are some easy answers to, to how you're going to get vision control. And right now you're being outnumbered very heavily. So great, like you're incentivizing your team to be an idiot, right? So like you're, you're incentivizing by pushing with three people, you realize that if you push and this Garen pushes, he's gonna get collapsed on, but you, you can't really push on, right? So can, you're kind of letting this guy in feed on, on sort of like on your command, so to say, right? Like if you guys back off and ping him back, he's likely, yeah, I know it's so look, you not guaranteed, but he's likely to stop as well. Right, so you don't you don't want to give him any more incentive to start inting here. It is just the fact that if you, that you can just soundly get this Baron right out of the way, so you don't need like you don't need to rely on this guy's skill shots, for example, now to to win the game. Like this guy keeps randomly throwing out cues, actually hits one, and goes in one versus four, right? And it's just very very silly gameplay. And uh, ARAM always looks very silly. If you just rotate to the Baron, it's much easier. So I'm not saying this couldn't work, I'm just saying it's not the easiest option. I want to be thinking, what's the, the damn easiest way to close out this game? And that's, that's how you should be closing it out, in my opinion, if you're this far ahead, right? You have so many resources on the opponent. Hello, my tablet doesn't want me to do what I want to do. All right. All right, so let's skip ahead a little bit. We still see mid lane gameplay. I don't really know what's a mid lane, right? It's like there's a tier one turret here. Well, that's not really too much of a resource at this point. Um, still a B-Ron. I'd say the B-Ron is, is the main main attraction, right? The main point, pointy point of the game oh hoo, hoo, hoo. I don't know what I'm seeing but yeah I mean it is also hard to push against a Teemo like you're gonna get chunked out all the time and in this case you kind of just brute force your way through it and uh, get some kills but you see how how you guys are all getting absolutely demolished by the team lo teamless rooms, barely surviving. How hard is this, right? And you have uh, Lee Sin, Ace Cadence, Jungle taking his rep buff away from the uh, late game Ash, right? So you get the inhibitor, and the first thing is like make sure you communicate with your team because communication actually serves very well in in solo queue like this might sound strange but it's actually very very effective a lot of people um if you, if you ask anyone how they feel about pings they will always say like it's a nuisance it's a this it's a that um, but everyone is it, the, the general consensus is that everyone's affected by it so if you ping someone go here go here go here um, they either have to respond to that, but even if they don't, they have to be very resolved in their decision not to do that. So it's kind of a psychological game where you force someone to be committed to their decision no matter what it is. Um, and in this case, you want to be motivating this Lee Sin to move over here. So if I were, for example, Ash, I would be taking these bottom side camps on a little bit of an off moment to incentivize Lee Sin to stay in his top side, right? You really want to incentivize the junglers to move where they should be moving. And you as a support can obviously, again, deport over here. Lane ward may be deeper in this case because you guys have a lot of control. Um, you know, you can put one ward, let's say one ward and pixel brush. And just keep controlling that area and ask people to join you. Just, you know, assistance ping, assistance ping, assistance ping. Just keep motivating people to come. Alright, so that's the end of the play-by-play -play part, because I don't see this making a whole lot of headway. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't know the disconnect, uh, what, what that was about, I don't I don't mind, right? Like, that's not really the point of the review. Um, anyway, that is just a play-by-play. -play. I will be going into my general thoughts about your own analysis and the things I saw, what you can do with that in part four. So, hang in there. Alright. 
Okay, so this is part four, where I'm going to be connecting the dots. So we did a lot of play-by-play. -play. Um, we talked about isolated traits, right? Those are a huge aspect of bottling. Essentially, there's all sorts of variables that that are like part of the fundamentals of laning. Let's say your auto attack, uh, whether it's up or down, is like a huge deal, right? And your positioning around that is, is huge. So let's say you auto attack, it makes sense to move back for just a little second. And then as you get your auto attack back, you walk forwards again. So you get all these micro movements in lane back and forth and back and forth a little bit. That's just very natural gameplay, right? And you get four people in a lane, and then when someone walks up a little bit, at some point, it becomes an isolated trade. It becomes 2v1, right? So you want to make sure that you register where people are. If someone's moving too far back, you might be forced to pull back as well, right? If you want someone to move forwards, you can move a little bit in front of them, right? And track their response and see if they follow you. And then if they do so, you can fo follow them by moving forwards some more, right? Until you reach your pocket. So... Those little details in lane can help out a lot, um, right? Uh, animation locks, let's say you have these mini routes, right? These mini routes that are known as auto channeling an auto attack, right? And, and drop your ability during that time frame and it hits them pretty consistently on most champions. So those little, little bits of things. Taking active trading stances, I just indicated how you can achieve that in a two-man lane. In a one-man lane, you can just do that on your own. But here you need to be a little bit delicate with trying to push someone in your direction. Um, but the point is as well is that there's also a limit to it. So let's say if the minion wave is over here, there's all sorts of stuff happening. Um, it's rarely sensible to walk very far outside of that. Because what if a gang comes in? Or what if they 2v1 trade against you and back off very quickly, right? The, the, these kind of situations don't usually play out very well. Um... So just make sure that you're aware of that as well. And those are just some patterns that I saw. And one, one more that I mentioned was hesitation, right? Where there's a moment where um, a fight breaks out over here, a fight breaks out over here. And you're kind of sitting still over here for a few seconds. Where the question is, where do you go? And you want to make sure that quite early on you need to make that decision. Because this fight was almost over before you got there. Um, and if in the case, let's say if this was slightly different and Ash could be losing, then obviously that little bit of time can make the difference between her living or not. Those are very important moments in the game. Alright, so with that out of the way, I want to just look at your review a little bit. I, I already looked at it, of course, but just uh, pull it up. So, first of all, yeah, I didn't analyze the runes in my uh, analysis. I did look at some things with u.gg before and found some differences and that kind of stuff. Honestly, I would always say, like, go with u.gg unless you have a very good reason, very good insight knowledge, very reliable knowledge that something else works better. It is possible. It is possible. There are instances in which I know of that another build was more effective than what u.gg converges on. Very rare, though. Like, use the pro, pro builds analysis tool, use the server-wide analysis tool, and just find some consistent setups that make sense to you. Um, all right. So, Timo has considerable burst, levels 1 to 4. I would want to say that Timo is a scaling champion that has a very particular function in the lane. Uh, Timo works in melee versus ranged. And works against auto tank based champions. But Zyra is a caster. So she really, really, really shits on Teemo quite hard. And even Ash has that little bit of poke. That little bit of poke and that little bit of a slow to set up and eat through the blind. Right? Let's say he slowed and you just walk, 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 walk after him. And then you start autoing him. Like those little aspects of the kit really make it that you guys are going to destroy Teemo. Which is going to leave Draven in a very awkward situation. So, yeah, that's uh, we we want to avoid getting bursted and take longer trades. I would say it depends. It depends um, if if the positioning on both sides is perfect. Then you know it's rarely like I don't I don't know. Mm, 
it's hard to talk about the what if people played in a way that they never played in game, but you can always run down Timo V oversteps, and honestly, that happened quite a bit this game. Extended trades. I mean, if you think about it, does Timo have any tools to extend the trade? Like he doesn't have any s sort of part to his kit that charges up. Ash does. Um, I would say that Draven and Timo have quite a l just a little bit of burst, while you guys have some charge up abilities. You have damage over time to the plant, so you guys actually win the extended uh, trades. Oh wait. Oh, yeah. I see. I see now. We want to. What the way I read is, we want to avoid getting bursted, and and then you carry over the vor uh, the verb and say and avoid taking longer trades. But it says and take longer trades. But so what you mean is, you do want to take longer trades. So that was my bad. That is actually, I just read that inappropriately. My bad. So you're entirely right. Entirely right. Lethal tempo. You have the Q. You have to plan damage over time. You're completely correct on that. So completely 100%. <laughs> my bad. All right. So. I don't... Um, there's a lot of I notice um, what you what you are analyzing. So first of all, I always very very much appreciate when someone puts effort into their analysis. And no matter what I think of it, when you start analyzing your gameplay, you're a hundred billion steps ahead of anyone who doesn't. That's the first thing I want to say. Right before I just start critiquing everything that you actually say and analyze, like that's that's the given of the situation. But then when I look at it, it's like um, it's very observational, right? So let's say it's a in in a way I would say it's almost like a report of what happened rather than an analysis of what happened, like breaking it down and saying this is what should have happened. This, these are the concepts that explain why it happened. And you did that a little bit in, in not saying that it's a black or white situation where it's like, oh, you don't do this or you do this all the time. I'm just saying, let's say, for example, here, it's like, um, uh, I misstep and greet for an auto and dra Draven. I don't, I remember that situation. In that situation, Timo, I mean, yeah, okay, so... Timo procs Q and PTA, I flash out, Ash follows up, Timo dies to both of us, I walk up with the main intention of zoning Draven off, and a secondary intention of pushing to the tower. Um, the way the way I, let's say I, I got hired for skill capped, and skill capped then started being very uncommunicative and very difficult to work with and doesn't just... Like, I don't even know how to send in the reports of the hours that I worked. I'm not even getting paid. It's, like, very, very sloppy and, and, and miserable. But the fact is, obviously, the fact that I got hired was mainly due to the way that I talk in the mentoring chats. And the structure behind it is always very clear. Let me... Oh, whoops. Secret information, everyone. So let me pull up an example of that. Because I'm not saying you need to do what I do, I'm just saying, I'm going to give an example. Oh, whoops. Oh, whoops. Can I get anything out of... I, I, I thought I was going to get in jungle. Yes, thank you. This is getting a little bit awkward. All right. All right, this is a flow chart. So usually I start with some sort of thesis or some sort of remark, right? So fundamental concepts that you list your options and pick the best one. This would be low. It's hard to achieve that with a flow chart. And that's like the concept. So instead of starting with a flow chart and saying flow chart is very hard. And then I say, well, the, the concept of decision-making, blah, 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 blah. I start with my thesis, and then I relate it back to the concept at hand. And then I start expanding on that. All right, I'll see you in the next part. Okay, so part five, which is 
the second part of analyzing the you know the your VAT review and just making some overarching remarks about the game so I was just talking about um, didactical structure that you can use to explain things to other people but also to yourself to to get a better understanding of certain concepts so let's say I would be starting out with some sort of thesis or some sort of goal right let's say I'm like in that lane it's like I want to finish slow push right so you have like a goal right finish the push and how do you achieve that goal it means that you're going to take trading stances and you're going to use abilities on waves right I'm not gonna write all of it out and then you're going to go into the specifics right like you use Q you use this you do like you walk over here and and you look at what this guy does and then you walk up some more and otherwise you have to walk back a little bit right so you have this kind of structure where this is at the start of it and then you dissect it a little bit and then you dissect it even further right and you get this kind of tree like structure that starts out with your general underarching theme and then you start decomposing it that's what analysis is right and then the alternative is what a lot of people actually do is instead they go into the specifics immediately right those little parts that I said here so yeah yeah, yeah. so in this case you want to use Q and E on the minion wave and then it starts pushing and then you want to walk up and then you go go like they kill the minions and then you you get the plate and you go back and there's no underarching point there it's just yeah use this ability use this ability blah 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 and somewhere in their mind they are aware of the concepts of slow pushing they're aware of the concepts of taking trading stances and blah 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 but they don't know how to communicate it effectively and you can be aware of that in your own analysis as well right so let's say um, you start with well, you start with a statement like here my goals are this this and this so skill cap does that honestly i am not a big fan of how they manage things but i'm a big fan of how they analyze things so they start with a mission statement and then they contextualize a play in terms of some of these missions that they have in the lane right so let's say um and then there's the lane fundamentals, right? Which they usually don't talk about directly, but you can always relate a play back to one of the lane fundamentals as well, instead of a particular goal in that lane. So that's what you want to do with your plays. Kind of try and contextualize it a little bit and give it some more structure. Um, that's just a general remark, right? So let's say, think about how are you going to benefit from the analysis, right? So for example when you talk about autopiloting you might say like i noticed that usually in the mid mid game i start autopiloting a lot and i'm gonna talk in in this section about how i can prevent that and you can notice when i autopilot because i do this and this and that and you have a little bit of a st sort of structure to it right um which brings me to my next point so i notice that the solution so let's say wh whatever you want to call it i just put it in like a little diagnosis and treatment with like a very common way of mentioning it is um looking for errors and fixing them right like whatever you want to call it doesn't really matter too much but your diagnosis is my mid to late game decision making was poor i want to be thinking about the neutrals and the win cons and i slowly started to autopilot i think that's very very true that's a very very true remark but the there's such a big point in the laning phase to be made which you didn't notice which is like that is completely fine that's what i'm here for is to hopefully demonstrate some things that i might be able to add which might not be immediately obvious um so if you if you look at your diagnosis I would say it's not incorrect. It's ho uh, it's it's only incomplete. And then the treatment part is the most important part which is missing. So I'm going to propose a few things. For example, I would say 
hesitation one thing you can try and do that's something I noticed I know I don't know if you agree with it but I would always recommend to try out the solution either way is to make it to reflect on the situations in the game as quickly as you can and make a decision within let's say two seconds right which is just an indication but make a decision very quickly right and force yourself to do that so let's say even if you're not sure what to do you go with a decision and if it turns out to be horrible you're going to investigate how you're going to give yourself more time to evaluate but you can only do that if you've established that the problem is the time you give yourself to evaluate you might already know what the real good play is and do that consistently but just not have the confidence to go ahead and make the call anyway right so that is just one example of how you can treat that problem in lane i would focus on isolated trades notice where everyone is and if someone steps up really far you punish that um i would say observe the quadrilateral is what i would say right constantly look for the quadrilateral look for someone breaking it up and making it very awkward and punish those players if someone walks really far back that's punishable if they walk really far up that's punishable if your player walks up you might want to follow them along a little bit behind them maybe um again to to conserve a little bit of that integrity of the quadrilateral on your side of things because that impacts whether or not someone can take isolated trades against you right so instead of saying well you need to watch out for isolated trades i formulated in something you can watch something you can do like look at where the people are and fix fix these irregularities of one person going like this fix it fix it by going in on them fix it by uh by, by like moving along with them if it's your laner right make sure that you observe it and do something about it that's the second point third point which you already mentioned let's say you always want to be thinking about the next move right if you're on baron you always want to be thinking what am i going to do after baron what am i going to do after i go base do i even want to go base during the baron you want to be thinking about that if you're uh if you're in base you want to think about it as well if you're moving on to the map right any time you make some sort of decision any time you base you want to do a little evaluation of the game state and your next objective any time that you complete an objective same thing any time that you make a rotation same thing right so these big events that that impact the flow of the game you want to take those as evaluation moments and just look at what you should be doing next um if you drill that in very hard like let's say you drill it in very hard then it, it, it combats autopiloting as well um if that is very hard we can always dive into the specifics of how you can achieve that but that's a starting sort of framework by which you can try and combat autopiloting a little bit. Let's see, another thing, let's. Mm. Yeah, map awareness is a big point. That's fair. You're aware of that. You're proposing a solution to. Are you saying, I can solve it? Don't worry about it. I have that under control. I will work on that. Absolutely fine. Very sensible. All right. So, with that, I think. There, those are just a few small things that you can work on. Obviously, I only saw one game. There's probably more if, if I saw different uh, games, right? This is just a start. But those are just a few things you can think about and really try and actively work on. And, and in terms of analysis, I would really recommend to apply some more structure and less volume and try and get down to the causes behind things more so than the... Uh, stream of events by which it happened because that's going to be very overwhelming if you did this for every game so you are allowed to be terse even though i'm so often not terse um you re it's really really about the structure you apply to it and how you get to your solutions all right so i hope you enjoyed that i really appreciate that you went along with this i'm sorry for the delay on this as well i hope that you have a good climb you have a good day and I'll see you sometime soon.